Hi guys, welcome to the green room. Hi. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for joining. I'm so sorry that I'm late. Oh my God, I, I love that I'm like the host and I'm late. That's, that's, that's really great. But I will very, Jenna, very Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> well, for anybody watching, this is the lovely Parson James, who I love dearly, so I'm so happy that you're here today. And then Kevin Alderson from Calgary, Alberta, and he's here as our guest therapist. So I'm very excited about that. And then Hannah Babbitt, who is my everything. <laughs> I just love her. Um, I think this is going to be like our fourth episode, I believe, right, Hannah? Correct. So Hannah moderates for, for the green room and, and that's basically it. So I'll let Hannah take it away. So today we have Jenna Andrews, the founder of The Green Room. Jenna is also a platinum singer, songwriter, vocal producer, and executive producer for artists such as BTS, Benny, Noah Cyrus, JLo, Little Mix, and Drake, to name a few. Jenna also a &Rs artist Noah Cyrus and Lennon Stella at Records, and is the co-owner of 27 Music Publishing with Barry Weiss and Sony ATV. Hi, Jenna. Hello. Hi, Jenna. <laughs> Dr. Kevin Alderson is a registered psychologist of 40 years and professor of counseling psychology from the University of Calgary. He recently served as president of the College of Alberta Psychologists, which regulates psychology in Alberta, Canada, and is known for his writing and activism in the LGBTQ plus psychology and issues as well as addiction. Dr. Alderson is a professional member of the Association for Addiction Professionals, and he holds the highest level of membership within the International Society of Substance Use Professionals. Dr. Alderson has also authored 11 books, most recently including Addictions Counseling Today, Substances and Addictive Behaviors, and a soon to be released book called The Concise Guide to Opioid Addiction for Counselors, published by the American Counseling Association. Hi, Kevin. Hi. And then we have our guest, Parson James. Parson is a multi-platinum selling singer and songwriter from South Carolina. He catapulted to the top of the charts and gained, gained instant global fame, having penned and sang on Kygo's hit, Stole the Show, and has continued to release music, including his single, High Tide, Low Tide, and today's release of the song, Bigger. Parson is also an outspoken advocate for the LGBTQ plus community and became a board member for the Love Loud Foundation founded by Dan Reynolds of Imagine Dragons. He has also been a contributor to organizations such as GLAAD, The Trevor Project, and Ampar. Welcome, Parson. We need to insert some claps, um, that would be. <laughs> um, well, thank you guys for coming and um, I'll just, you know, briefly tell everybody what Hannah is, you know, Hannah is also a music manager, manages a lot of incredible songwriter producers, but also is on the, um, what would you call it? Like the board of She Is The Music. And She Is The Music is um, a sponsor of The Green Room because obviously, you know, we're, this is something, especially me and Hannah um, are strong advocates for females in our business and obviously just anybody in our business. So I know She Is The Music supports males too, but it's like, you know, it's, female led. So, um, and then as always, um, another sponsor is the Jed Foundation, which is also, well, primarily what we're all here for, you know? Um, but yeah, mental health is something that just affects everybody, I think, you know, and I think, and now we're in a time that people feel more comfortable talking about it, which is so cool. Cause I think for, for a lot of years, um, people just felt so uncomfortable talking about their mental health. And I, especially as us as creative people, it's, I feel our responsibility to help other people because also creatives are a little bit more outspoken about how they feel. So that's another reason we're doing this. So for anybody listening or watching, please, if you feel inclined, um, we will put donation links in the chat. So if you want to donate to mental health, the Jed Foundation, please do so. So yeah, there we go. We can start our therapy now um so but anyway yeah so I guess I'll just kick off by saying that we're here to talk about body image and you know I know that we've discussed body image on the green room before but I think not in the way that you know Parson feels and I think that you know obviously Parson in a second I'll let you sort of take the take the lead on this and sort of you know let me know 
how exactly it feels because I know we've talked about it briefly, but not to the extent where I feel like I know you want to share. So anyway, I've dealt with it a lot in my life, um, but I know certainly the way you deal with it um, is different for many different reasons. So yeah, tell everybody if you can, just kind of like this is we just sort of like to jump in. So yeah, no, um, yeah, I, body image is something that I think that so many people deal with. We obviously know that, um, yeah. and you know, one case or you know the way that this side deals with it versus this side is you know there's no one that is like hurting more or less than the other is but for, for me like the way that I have experienced body image issues has been kind of specific to my community like the LGBT community standards and um expectations pressures to you know look a certain way in order to be included in the narrative that is just existing as a gay person like for me I'm a gay man of color and I, um, you know, have been living in LA for about three years. Um, and there's this culture that is just, um, you know, hyper-focused on the white male that has muscles and looks this way. And, you know, you know, I, so for, for me, I've experienced um, body image issues in that way, trying to appease or appeal to people to feel included. Um, or to feel accepted, wanted, even you know, for for love, for um, to feel worthy enough for uh, I don't know. It's even bled into like how I feel viewed as an artist. It feels that I have struggled to think that I, you know, my talent is this thing, and then I look this way, so I can only go so far because oh. I don't look the right way or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, it's been, I mean, that's been a challenge. It's been, it's been difficult. I've dealt with it for a long time. It's not new. Um, I think that we talked about this yesterday about how yeah. it's the act of coming out, you know, already you feel born with an immense amount of shame uh, and pain. Like, you know, to have to come out, to have to like explain why you love someone, you know, to have to do that already is just like a lot. Yeah. I think that like, the people around you that are in your community would have this sort of fellowship of like, Oh, I feel you. I know, I know how that feels. And instead I've, I've experienced it in a way where it's like, they're not, it's not been so accepting. It's like, no, I don't know where it comes from. Like people are processing their shame differently um, right. and creating these like carved out things of like perfection and like, what it has to look like in order to be okay to be you know in this community or whatever did you find it like as a kid um growing up like when when did you start to realize that you felt these ways like did you was it something that you feel like you had to repress growing up and and like yeah tell it tell tell us about that I mean I think this I think that you know I, I grew up in a really small town in South Carolina okay. like five people very bible belt very like stereotypical very like exactly what like if you watch on a movie how annoying those rednecks and shit are that's like where I grew up um and so I think you know my mom had me at such a young age when she was 16 and she's white and my dad's black and that was like already a problem and right. um, so I think that very early on I felt the effects of being different already um my mom was like not accepted by her family she was you know thrown physically out of her house when her family found out that she had a black boyfriend and she was, you know, carrying a mixed child. Um, and as much as I like my mom, like she had, she did everything in her power to like give me the best life and make me feel beautiful, remind me that my skin color was amazing and that like my eyes were, you know, she was, she was constantly giving me that. You can't not feel, uh, you know, why are we not at my grandma's house? Why is there, a confederate flag why are we hearing the n-word like oh so i just feel being born into that already gave me some sort of awareness of like okay i don't belong or fit in mm -hmm. um, and then as life went on and stuff i just uh, you know i knew i knew that i was gay from i, I think when i was four as my first memory like really? yeah having a crush on like my childhood best friend and um also, there was just like this time, this, this, this girl, these group of girls like chased me around the playground or something and all like pinned me down to kiss me. And I was so mortified. I was like, 
you guys did not consent with me. (laughs) So I knew I was gay from a really, really young age. So with that and with where I grew up, just looking around, I was like, okay, I am this, I am gay and, but I cannot speak up about it. Like I gotta be quiet and I gotta like, kind of like play the game and like whatever. So that with the race issue, um, just gave me a warped view of who I was and what I looked like and like how I felt about myself. And so, you know, by the time that I was a teenager, I, uh, I think that like, it just got to like a fever pitch, like a point where, um, I was just constantly questioning everything. I was so skinny. Like I was, I, I was like 120 pounds. At one really? Point. Yeah. I, and I wasn't as a kid, I was so big as a kid. And then something happened, you know, where I, I don't, there's just like one memory that I have of not being invited to someone's birthday party at school. But, and this is when you were still big. And in my head, I was like, it's because I'm so fat. Oh, wow. And, and then I, I, that is definitely not the reason why, but like I was internalizing and I was going through that emotion and that, that experience from that early on. We were in like sixth grade. Yeah, I, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. And then I just, I lost all this weight, like all of it. Like I, I, I didn't eat, I like just... Start like starve myself. I gave myself at most some tuna or uh, some like salad, no dressing, just like bland, so I could lose all this weight. Because I was like, oh, when I lose all this weight, I'm gonna be invited to the party. I'm gonna be, um, <laughs> I'm gonna, it's gonna feel normal. But realistically, I looked crazy because I'm a stocky guy. Like I'm just supposed to be a stocky guy. Like I have broad shoulders, big chest, like the whole thing. I, I, my head was bigger than my body at that point, at that <laughs> point or whatever. And, um, yeah, I just, yeah, I just remember like that happening and then it continued to happen. It, it, it only got worse. It only got worse. Actually, it's been worse. Uh, I, there's moments of clarity that I just like look in the mirror and I'm like, Dan, I love the way you look. And then within that same breath, it's like, <laughs> You know, I mean, it's 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 interesting. I just had a question, like when that happened to you, um, like when you said that you felt like you weren't invited to the party because of weight issues. Like you you say like subcon like you don't have any recollection of feeling any sort of other weight pro- like issues or thoughts before that moment, like ever. Mm-mm. I, I think it's because where I grew up, like the South, they want you to fucking eat. I was eating fried chicken all fucking time, so like I didn't think about it. Like, um, you know if you go to your grandma's house and you don't eat the plate of food that she's made you, it's like a disrespect thing. <laughs> like, so I, I, I guess I didn't think, and I, I, I don't know. Yeah. It was, it was, I think that moment that I, well, there's one other moment and this is like a lot to talk about. I had an aunt who was, she is still alive, but um, she was so small. She was like 80 pounds. Um, and she got hospitalized for a collapsed lung because she was making herself throw up a lot all the time. And I heard the word bulimia thrown around. Oh, really? Yeah. And I didn't know what it meant. And so I was just this kid, I was probably 10 or nine or something. And, you know, my dad is, you know, that's a, a lot to talk about, but um, he was around at that time at my grandma's house. And I asked him what the word bulimia meant. And he told me it's something you should be. And I was like 10 and I was, you know, fucking happily chubby kid. But when I figured out what it was and she had been hospitalized for it and it it, it will make you skinny. Like, yeah. I mean, I was making myself throw up from that time, like 10, 11. I got caught. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. I didn't know that. That was the first probably moment that I felt not okay in the body and then then it just like sticks in your mind I guess and so something as simple as a birthday party like not being invited to triggered something I don't know and Kevin like I mean maybe this is a good time to to bring you into it but do you find like um a lot of times when you're seeing people about these issues do you find that a lot of um 
these deep rooted issues are subconscious in people's minds? Like, do you think like when people come to you and they're like, oh, I'm dealing with this stuff. A lot of times is it something that like what Parson is mentioning, like that it's just something that's in you. And maybe, you know, you could have heard when you were five years old and is in your brain, but you're not really aware of sort of why you're feeling these ways. So I, I actually think that's a really interesting point that you bring up. You know, <clears throat> A lot of things are very conscious. People are, are quite aware of things like gay people are often aware <clears throat> that they're, they're gay from a young age. Like Parson, you mentioned from about the age of four, you were already having uh, crushes and crushes are often one of our first uh, indications that, uh, you know, our, our sexuality is developing in a certain way. Uh, I remember age six feeling uh, uh, similarly. <clears throat> That's not always the experience, though, by the way, and, and especially uh, many lesbian women don't really come into their, uh, their sense of self till a bit later. Um, while you were talking, Parson, I was thinking you were talking about getting invited to the party, <clears throat> and I thought that could almost be the title of your talk, Getting Invited to the Party. <laughs> Because there are so many things out there that we feel are going to exclude us, whether they're actually real or not. You thought maybe it was your weight. How many times have we thought, I didn't get invi invited to the party because I'm gay? How many times do you think you didn't get invited to the party because you don't have the body ideal that you've alluded to? You know, the, the ideal for men, and, and it's really across communities, straight men are feeling it too, the desire to have a, a muscular but slim body, not huge muscular, but just nice muscular. Uh, and, it, and it's true, if you have that kind of body, you're going to get invited to parties, but not just because you're the life of the party, but because you look good at the party, right? Mm -hmm. so getting invited to the party seems kind of central to some of our discussion here. Yeah, I agree with you. It's kind of crazy. You know, I, lo I love that you said that, Kevin, um, because when he said that too, I, I, that immediate, that thought went through my mind. In fact, even it, it, like to elaborate more on that thought, um, you know, obviously bringing it back to having the green room also like be something where mental health meets music. It's like in my mind, I'm like, oh my God, if we were writing a song right now, like that's an amazing song. Like, and I think that like at the end of the day, like it is true because I've gone through it too. And I think you and I have talked plenty about this that like, I've struggled with eating disorders my entire life and it's the same thing. It's like, exactly. You're, you're, you're constantly fearful of not being invited to the party. And that's the reason we do it. I mean, the thing is, is that we want to please people, right? It's like, that's, that's part of it. And it's, even if I can sit here as your friend and say, why do you care about pleasing people? You're so fucking amazing. Like everyone loves you, but then you can't give yourself the same advice. You know what I mean? And you're like, yeah. I look at you and I'm like, Oh my God, you're, like so talented, so freaking cute, like so like everything about you. I'm just like, you dress so well, like you're so cool. Like everything about you is so obviously great. But I think when it comes to yourself, it's so much harder to identify those qualities, you know? So it's, 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 um, that's why I think this is, especially when it comes to body image, you know? And you know, I, I can totally relate to that in the sense that like, you know, I think that when, when, if you have body dysmorphia, it has so much, um, like it, it has so much, uh, power in like your day and your confidence and stuff. So like, if you look in the mirror and you're like, I look so fat, like, it's almost like impossible for you to know how to like communicate to people in like the world. Cause you're like thinking the whole time you could be at a Starbucks line and you're like, Oh my God, they literally think that I'm the fattest person ever. Crazy. Like I literally, there's so many times where I'm like, standing at you know a restaurant or whatever the case may be like even if I'm just like sitting out ordering food or something and I'm like damn the way like the waiter is looking at me weird because <laughs> I, I felt like that before why would he want to be eating you know that or whatever like it, it, there, there's just so many times where I'm like it is it is just it is not an easy or you know it doesn't feel good to like always feel like everyone's like just you know no I know so and I've had I've had to like snap myself out of it a bunch but I totally get what you're saying like I it is such an odd thing 
you know? And it changes like all the time, like day by day. Mm. I was gonna say that like for the way you describe um, the LGBTQ community is seems in the way that you feel like it's weird, like you 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 spend so much of your life repressing that, and then when you come out, you think, okay, this community is gonna accept me. I kind of feel like that as like a female. I feel like as females, we go through a shit ton. You know what I mean? And I think that like we're constantly trying to prove ourselves on why we can be as talented or as smart as a male, right? And, and it's always like, oh my god, work ten times harder, and you think you meet this girl, and you're like, oh my god course they're going to support me like you know what it's like and all of a sudden they're the first person talking behind your back and you're like are you kidding me like what I thought we were on the same team so I totally get that and it's it's so funny because when you were talking about like your experience I was thinking of my experience in high school because like all the meanest people that gave me a body dis or like gave me um my my anorexia was all girls they were so mean to me they're like you're so fat you're so ugly blah 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 and it's like the whole time of course you're like yeah you're right that's the thing like you don't think like you're jealous because yeah. that's what that's kind of actually why right it's like if you think about it it's like that's the thing it's like of course they're jealous but like at the end of the day you don't even think i like how could they be jealous of me i'm like such a loser right it's like so why fucking me like like exactly and that's empathetic people pleasing person like I, i'm like how are you why what am i what am i doing <laughs> like what have i done like I, you know if anyone's gonna beat it i promise you i talk more shit to myself than you could ever talk to <laughs> like, oh. like, <laughs> exactly like do you feel as an artist like for one too like obviously being like just in the gay community and all these things and dealing with that just as a person for one, but as an artist, that's somebody that people look up to. Um, what is that like? Do you feel like that empowers you or makes it like harder to be accepted? Like, do you, f yeah, I guess uh, that's my question. <laughs> no, wait, 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 you're saying, um, you're asking if being a openly gay artist feels empowering or? Yeah, I guess I'm just asking, does it feel like because you're an artist and you have something to share with people and, and, and hopefully you can help people, you know, with your music, does that give you a confidence hmm. outside of, you um, know, no. all the, yeah. It's funny though, because like most of my fans are not <laughs> gay. So I, I feel that I'm always getting messages wow. from like, you know, lesbian women or older women or um, even like frat, like because of the Kygo thing, because EDM is so like, right. you know, and you know, hetero, but I get, so much I get so many like messages and stuff that really really do you know I don't live for them like I'm not like looking for that in terms of validation and stuff but I, it warms my like it makes me feel like purposeful it makes me feel like I was supposed to do that for that person that like you know probably didn't wasn't ever able to express their com uh, their emotions and they were able to like connect to a song that like I wrote about something completely different but they got it in this way. So it does feel, yeah, there is times where it feels, it does give me like new life and it is a motivator because I want to be honest as possible with everything that I do so that people feel comfortable to be honest with themselves. So. Wow, I love that you said that. Yeah. I feel that it is become my duty whatever like however big my platform is or will be or was or whatever when using the platform i have to always think about my younger self and how there was really no one for me to look to to be that honest and it is scary it's scary every single time that i really tap in and like i write a song or i write something that is coming from a place that um is scary, uncomfortable, vulnerable, whatever. It, it, it's obviously hard to be vulnerable. Um, yeah, very. I have to, like, I have to, for me and for anyone, you know, I don't care if it's like 10 people that hear it or a million, like, it has to be honest. It has to be vulnerable. It has to be raw. And it has to be exactly how I'm feeling because I know that someone's going to connect to it in a, whatever way they do. Like, have you ever been in like a situation where you've been, I'm trying to think like maybe it's like like an industry thing or something where you're like 
like, I don't know if it's an interview or performance, something like that. And something has struck a chord for that body image thing. And you feel like you're just going to have a complete panic attack breakdown. And like, how do you deal with that? Like in that moment when you're on and you're like, literally like, okay, I can't fall apart. One, have you ever fallen apart? Yeah. Two, what, how, what do you do? Like the sense mechanism, my, um, <laughs> my coping mechanism is just be funny and just like, you know, like make a joke or, you know, turn on your fucking charm and like be the best version of yourself. So they'll fall in love with you and not like look at your body. Like, you know, wow. like, okay. make the eye contact, just be completely like, you know, you know, and yes, I have fallen apart before. You um, have. So um, tell me about that. What, what? Um, I've had not many, but a few panic attacks prior to stage where I thought I'm not going to go on there like and not going to perform and they're usually wow they usually were in rooms that were small like for for a crowd that really was like industry driven um uh, I'm trying to think of one instance there was a show at Brooklyn Bowl that I was playing and it was like RCA's introduction of me to you know everyone and like I just uh I don't know. I, I thought like there's no way I can go step out there looking the fucking way that I look right now. Like there's no way. And at that time, if I'm thinking back to it, you know, I was wearing like size 30 jeans. Like I was fucking normal. Like I, I just, but at that time I was like, they're going to a collectively talk and discuss and drop me. Oh my God. <laughs> and you know, they're going to see, we can't represent that person the way that he looked out there. Um, so yeah, I, I like didn't want to go. I like wasn't going to go on stage. Like I was not. Do you feel like like for anybody watching, like as in terms of a coping mechanism and the way that you just said, like you make a joke or do something like that? Do you feel that that also makes you feel better? Like, would you recommend that to somebody like going through a similar feeling? Like, um, and maybe maybe obviously you're an artist and they're not. They're just in a situation maybe going back to at a party and they don't feel good and they have anxiety like how how and they don't and they feel like you know that that person where they're in the corner and they're like oh my god I want to leave right now like how who what would you suggest to somebody like that going through that feeling going through all that anxiety and stuff you are forgetting your best qualities and you're thinking too much about this when there's just so much more to you than this you know you know people fall in love like you can be very 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 attractive and have a shitty personality and it's you know you you're no yeah. you're no longer attractive <laughs> um literally yeah so literally. That, that for me remembering like snap out of it like just be your just be yourself just be yourself just you know give people who you are because at the core like i am everything that i just was describing like I am funny and I am, you know, smart and I am witty and I am like charming. And I have to remind myself of this stuff. Like, in but those, do, you, do you believe that? Like, I'm asking you pretty honestly. Well, I, do know, you I know actually that. believe that. I know that. Okay. I don't remember it, but it's, it. that I, I just need to remind myself more often. But no, some days I'm totally like, not at like for some days it's like and it, 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 it fucks with my relationships it fucks with romance a lot like yes, I was that was my next that was that was my so that's I mean yeah I mean listen with with body image that's something so deep like do you feel that when it comes to like intimacy and things like that like is that something that's like and obviously if you feel uncomfortable answering but I was literally thinking of that like do you feel like oh I don't want to take my shirt off or like um I mean, I've never been someone that takes my shirt off at the pool like I don't I've not done that and there's maybe two to three random moments in the last like 15 years that I've ever taken my shirt off at a pool like wow um and you know I've been in relationships like oh my last boyfriend who is a great person and great guy. He, he was constantly like telling me like, you're so, you're so beautiful. Like you're da, 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 da. take your shirt off, take your hat off. Like 
I've developed all these issues with just my outward appearance that like, you know, he was desperate to have me just in my raw form. And I could do that for people that I don't know, fans and whatever, but I can't with people that I'm close to because I'm like, you're going to leave me if you really know what I look like. You know, if I'm taking my shirt off, if the lights are on while we're having sex or like, you know, so, I mean, I, I knew it was a, a big me issue because he, I mean, he spent every day to tell me that I looked amazing. Like he tried really hard and I wow. just like did not be, like. And you didn't believe it like at all, like ever. Wow. Well, it so, almost makes you feel worse too, because if you're not feeling good about yourself, you don't really want anyone else telling you that you're great and you're beautiful. So if you don't feel that way, it's almost like you're lying to me. Yeah, that's what it was. I was like, you're fucking. I don't believe you. I mean, Kevin, what do you think on that topic? Yeah. Kevin, yeah, what do you think? You know, you know, Parson, you've been talking a lot about this need to be authentic. And, you know, to be authentic is about something a lot more core and deep about you than your outside appearance. Uh, and, and I'm just reminded about, um, well, a couple of things. One is we're all so afraid of rejection. Uh, I remember a poem written a while back called Children Learn What They Live. And uh, your viewers might just want to pull up that poem, but it talks about what we are raised with is what we internalize and, and become. So if we're raised uh, in a very loving home, then we tend to turn out to be loving individuals. Uh, the experience of so much of our queer community, um, they have not had that experience, you know, at least in most minority groups, you know, your parents share that same minority group status. So, you know, Parson, if both of your parents were black, then, then you would have a very strong, well entrenched black identity and you'd feel good. But that doesn't mean after you come out as gay that your parents are gonna share that identity. And, and in fact, many times, I think especially in the South, uh, you're gonna face a lot of opposition and rejection. And I did notice there was a question by uh, someone about if you, if you are raised in the deep South and you're gay or lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, whatever, do you have to leave in order to be, become a, a real person? And uh, I, I would be actually really curious, Parson, to hear your perspective because you were raised in the South. Did you feel you had to leave there in order to, to embrace yourself and be accepted? Yeah, there was desperation. I was desperate. Like there was, and you know, I visit where I'm from, you know, obviously like every year or so for holidays and stuff. And it's, 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 it's truly just, it's not changed. Um, you know, now I'm treated differently because I've had success and I come home and the South is very much a like, be kind to your face sort of place. Um, I felt that you know, to the point where I was like, I got to graduate high school early. I can't do this. Like I had, so, you know, it was, I was 17 when I left. Like, I was like, I have, if, if I don't get out of here, it, it was a feeling of like, like, I wanted to like scratch my skin off. Like I just like, couldn't be faking it anymore. Like I was like, so desperate to like, I knew, I knew personally that there was like another world out there. Like I knew it, I, I was in a bubble. You know, and in LA and New York and stuff like that, we're in bubbles too. In music industry as creatives, we're in bubbles because we are so accepting and we just, like, you know, obviously everyone's weird as fuck and crazy. So we're like, you know, you know, people are fine. But like in my bubble, I was like, no, like I, ha like, I have to find someone that feels like, like, even if it's just one person, which is why I think it's so important to be honest and open when I'm making art is because even if it was one, per if one person told me that it was okay to hold a another man's hand, I would have been like, oh my God, okay. I, kn I knew it, but I didn't know it until he told me, you know? And so, um, yeah, I think that from my experience, I had to, yeah, I had to leave. I, like, I had to get out of there. And um, I know people now that are there and they are struggling they're in relationships with women and they're gay <laughs> and they're hiding it and i think that that's the saddest thing in the planet to you know a bring someone else into your narrative but, but it's out of fear so you just kind of are 
acting on your fear and people around you don't want, you know, to accept, to accept. And you know that. So like, it's, it's, it's very hard to stay in places like that, you know? And I think that when I've done like shows in rural areas or whatever, like for pride or whatever, I always notice like in the smaller places like that, Southern or Midwestern or whatever, they're so fucking excited. They're so, they're, they're excited. Like, you know, LA, New York, we're jaded because we're in the bubble. Those places, they don't get this opportunity to, to meet and see people open and proud and whatever. So it's sad to me that people have to still live like that. You would think that that's, you know, an archaic way of thinking, but it's reality for a lot of people in a lot of places. So do you feel, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, you know, I, I've been meaning to say this. I think there is a caveat um, to what we're also saying about being authentic. And that is, if you're a minor, if you're a minor, you really have to judge your environment, your family life, to know whether it's going to be safe or not for you to come out. That back in the 70s, the scream was, we should all come out and we should holler it with pride. You do that when you're 15 years old in some families, you're going to get one hell of a licking or a lot worse. You're going to be beaten to a pulp and, and sometimes even worse than that. So um, I did want to ensure that young people realize you've got to look at your own situation that you didn't come out until you felt safe to do so, Parson. No. It, was, it was the same for me. I, I didn't come out until I knew I, I was empowered enough that I could handle it because I knew I was going to face <clears throat> rejection just as you knew. Mm -hmm. It's a question that I get all the time from, from you know kids in all these different countries and stuff like, and I always give that same advice. Like, I can't, I can't like, tell you to go run in the living room and scream that you're gay to your family if you're living in like Russia or somewhere weird or whatever and you're not safe to come out like you know it's you know I can't give the same advice to every person because everyone's living situation is so different and safety is the most important um and unfortunately there's a lot of people that are not living in safe environments and I would hate to as much as I am proud of being gay and I'm proud of who I am and you know, what our community stands for and whatnot, like you have to be careful and you have to be honest. Like you just have to, it's a, it's a case by case scenario, which is sad. So I just, I have a question for both you, Parson and for Kevin in different respects. So if you're a kid going in an unsafe environment that feels you know, very conflicted by these things and wants to come out and wants to, you know, embrace who they are, but again, doesn't feel safe or necessarily empowered by the people around them that, you know, love or don't like, you know, but just obviously the, the people around them. So I guess one question of mine would be like, what advice would you have just for them to embrace it within, the, within themselves? Like, you know, coming from you, Parson, as a, as a creative person, like, is there anything like, you know, that you suggest for people to do in those situations. And then Kevin, I would be curious, obviously just from a therapist point of view, what you would suggest for, for, for anybody struggling with that right now. I think that um, I, always, I always need to remind people that there's nothing wrong with them. Okay. Because there is nothing wrong with you. Just because, you know, there has been years and years and decades of, you know, homosexual lifestyle just like being up in the air in terms of like if it's accepted or not so because your parents or your grandparents or people around you are like struggling to accept or you know that they wouldn't accept if you came out you just have to as hard as it is self-love is really hard sit back and just know that there's nothing wrong with you no opinion ever is going to be unanimous about you regardless anyway but you know you're never going to please everyone as much as I'm a people pleaser, I know. Me too. <laughs> but when you really know that like there's no 
way to please everyone. There's truly not. And that you've done nothing wrong. You're existing as a human being in this world. I think that that makes, could make, has helped me or did help me um, realize or, it, you know, feel comfortable with myself and love myself a bit more because I know it wasn't me. It was everyone around, you know, when you know that it's, you know, people break up in relationships, they use that. <laughs> it's not you, it's me, whatever situation. It's, okay. it's truly like, it is not me. It's y'all. Like <laughs> I have done nothing. I've just been born and existed and am, you know, completely a normal human. I've done nothing. I, you know, thank you. It's hard to get there, but I think that's kind of the approach that I would, I take. Do you feel that helps? Because like, I'm just asking you these things also, because, you know, I feel that I go through them as well. Like, um, you know, because obviously the self-doubt and thinking like, oh, you know, being fat, like, am I fat or am I, do I suck? Am I not talented? Am I like everything, like every possible bad thing that you think about yourself, right? Do they hate me? All these things. And like, I find, I think this is what you're saying, but like, you know, if you say these things out loud to yourself, it's almost healthy right because it's like at the end of the day you can be thinking that but at some point you almost have to make it like a mantra or like actually say yeah. the words into the like yeah. because that's, right because otherwise it's like you're not gonna it's not gonna actually sink in yeah it's i mean affirmation right so you just gotta kind of remind yourself like I mean, my shirt says manifest that shit like i i, I, yes. I believe in manifestation in a big way because i feel like i manifest any and everything that i've ever wanted um, and there's power in words, there's power in saying things out loud, there's power in um, really believing what you're saying and just like getting a grip on yourself and just like fucking just owning it, claiming it and uh, making it a part of, you know, your everyday, because you really truly have to love yourself before you're able to love anyone else. I mean, that's like a RuPaul quote, but like, it is true. You have to find find it all here and I just, just as I have gotten older and stuff I just feel like more and more I'm like okay you know more so like my insecurities are coming from other people's problems and it's not really mine like I just gotta like step back fall in love with this person and you know that's hard to do but wow no I mean yeah I I, I, I love that advice I mean Kevin what would you say from a therapist perspective do you have um also I mean if 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 possible if you have any sort of like you know helpline or helplines or any websites that people can go to obviously that's always really helpful and of course you can send it to us after and we can you know I'll post all those things but that's always something that I like to offer people listening as well right uh you know first of all it's really hard to be queer in only the bubble of your own mind. Uh, the word queer, maybe not everyone is familiar with, but it becomes more and more awkward to say LGBTQQI, yeah. right? There's just so many different groups today. And uh, the word queer has actually been embraced as a positive uh, word to uh, really represent the entire community of people who define as sexually and or gender diverse in some way. So, so it's the inclusive term. So I, I, I mean that in a very positive sense when I use the word queer. Um, and, and, and so, so to be alone is just the most painful thing when you think you're the only person in your community that feels the way that you do. And so whether you're in a small town or a big city, you can feel this way. And so it really does help if you can get attached to at least an online support group. But there are some uh, national lines uh, in the United States and Canada as well. So for example, there's the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual and Transgender National Hotline. So 888-843-4564. Uh, there's also a national line for uh, youth people up to the age of 25, 800-246-7743. Uh, Several others, there's a trans line, 
I will send these to you after uh, so that people would have the, uh, the phone numbers. They all have websites as well for those who have, uh, you know, uh, access. So don't try and do this alone, you know, and especially if you're in a family who's not going to love you or support you. I've seen so many, uh, you know, young people from Muslim families. It's really, really tough. Uh, I remember a friend of mine, a, a fellow from Lebanon, and uh, he and I were going to the gay bar, and we came to the entrance, and outside he saw a taxi driver. He said, that man is part of my community, the Lebanese community. I cannot have him see me here. It will get back to my family. So I said, well, let's take a walk around the block. So we walked around the block three times, the taxi driver was still out there and I said to my friend, you know, I walked with you three times because I love you and respect you. But if I walk again, I'm going to start to feel diminished as a gay guy. And I'm a proud activist and leader in this community. So I, I cannot let myself sink into the place that I know you're there. And I, I wish I could help you more, but to say I welcome you as soon as you feel safe enough to enter. To be LGBT is an act of courage, and that act of courage is reflected in every moment of every day, uh, and you don't know when you're going to need to fight for yourself or for others. It could be just around the corner. Someone asked in the chat, how did I manage to become empowered? Well, it was, it was a tough, tough journey. I wrote about it in my first book, Beyond Coming Out. But in a nutshell, I was one of those guys that married a woman because my family was not going to deal with this, even though at some level I knew I was gay. And, uh, and then eventually I was breaking down, saw a psychiatrist. After a few sessions, I said to him, thanks, but I won't need to see you anymore. And he said, why? I said, because I'm checking out. You really helped me to accept this, but I cannot accept the consequences of this. And that really be, be, began my journey of becoming healed. And then when I became healed, I was outraged that I had to go through any, any of this. And so I've spent my career working to try and make it better for us. Wow. Yeah. That almost like made me want to cry. Yeah. <laughs> When you told me that, when you said that you walked around the block four times, like that's really powerful because I know I'm not gay, but I do know that I've, I can relate to struggling with a lot of things that make me feel unvalu in, unvaluable, I guess, is that the word, or not valuable, um, or, you know, just not accepted. So I feel like I can relate to that feeling. And I totally know what you mean by like, you have, at some point you, if you don't face it, you, then you blame yourself. Because what you were saying, Carson, is like, like the, there's so much power to being like, no, I'm good enough. I need to love myself. But when you actually are the one that's letting your own self down, you're like, oh my god, like, yes, this is crazy. like I'm letting myself down, and this is me. Like I'm supposed to be like my biggest cheerleader, and the fact that I'm hiding means that like no one's got my back. Because if I don't have my back, then I'm like fucks, <laughs> you know, not like, pardon my language, but you know, like, but the thing is, is yeah, like, I mean, you have to. And like, I think, again, the responsibility for us in our jobs, you know, we're not therapists or doctors, or, you know, it's like, but I believe that we can save people's lives through music. And I think that um, you, Parson, and the experiences that you've gone through and the pain that you feel really comes out in your music. And I think that when people listen to your songs, they actually can feel these things on such a deep level. And I think it's, you know, that that's actually super brave and courageous. And I think that's amazing that you're able to do that as a creative person and be able to change someone's life, you know? And I think I, this is why we do this, you know? And this is why we're here today. And this is why this is always very cathartic, you know? And you and I like obviously have written a lot. <laughs> yeah. and you know every time that I've experienced like being in a session with you or whatever you know I think you remind you do remind me of the importance of digging deep and like um and we hit yeah, I think we've always gone there when we've written songs together you know people haven't even heard them yet but like 
it is it is our duty it is our calling to you know if you're if you're in this industry and you're doing your thing like you have to you have to make a difference like you have to like there's no way to be in this for me there's no way to be in the music industry blessed enough to release music on a commercial level and not be speaking up like it, it, it just like it has to be, it has to be that way um i mean it has to be and i think that like you know especially if you are somebody that's dealt with these things right and i think you know it's funny i think hannah and i've discussed this before too but like another thing that it reminds me of what kevin mentioned about walking around the block four times is like you know going to like award shows and things like that because like that is so fearful for so many people and that's just in the music industry but like, like why do we go <laughs> so, like, what the sh like because i come out with so like i go in with so much anxiety then i get to a point yeah. like, i got I, I can remember like a few but i have to get like wasted in order to like <laughs> Exactly. And that, that's what I was thinking. Cause I don't know, like another thing I was thinking, Kevin, when you were saying that, like, I actually can remember like driving around the block, like, because you're like, Oh my God, I actually like feel like I'm going to be physically ill. Like, and you're like, I can't go. And I have like, okay, I have five more minutes to circle around or you like sit in the car. Cause you're so like literally shaking. And, and like, you're like, for, for me, I don't know. Like I'm mean, <laughs> saying for you, but like mine is always back to the weight. I'm like, right. You know, wow I'm, I'm glad that you okay yeah so going to the fucking award show means a red carpet means like uh whatever and this is just such first world first world problems in terms of like our industry or whatever but like it is really real you get into a room full of people that uh are doing what you're doing and you're doing your same job and immediately just feel this big like this big like just like i don't know I, I I always I'm like why the hell would me as a like such a self conscious and whatever person choose this fucking job <laughs> especially <laughs> part of it like <laughs> and the most ironic thing is everyone is in that room packed in together thinking about themselves it's so true <laughs> no one's sitting there being like what's Jenna wearing yeah. <laughs> So true. Everyone's like, wait, what am I wearing? What am I doing? Why am I here? When do I get to leave? Do I drink? Do I not drink? What? Clearly, I I also can relate to those anxieties, <laughs> but we speak about this and yeah, for me, it's right before the award show. It's like, all right, Hannah, you're there for two and a half hours. Just power through. And then I'm kind of out of it for two days after that because so much energy has gone into preparing for those two and a half hours of socialization and being in my own head. Yeah. Oh my God. I think that's so funny that you brought up that no one's thinking, like literally no one is. That's the thing that's yeah. crazy. And, 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 and Parson, you mentioned like the fact that like it's first world problems, but actually it's not because I really believe that like this is mental health is such a serious, serious issue. Like that, like if this is the way that you feel emotionally and it makes you feel a certain kind of way then I think that those problems are as real as any, any problem. Right. But, yeah. but in regards to award shows compared to going to literally the grocery store and feeling like, you know, in being in line and being like, Oh my God, does this person think because I'm buying a bag of chips that I'm like freaking like the fattest person that ever existed? Like, come on. I know it's gone through all of our brains. Like you're like, Oh my God, if I bring this, like, snack in are they gonna think that i'm always having to eat like you don't even do it should i order postmates or are they gonna judge me because like mm. my you know or do they think i eat or like you know like when people are like you're eating and you're like do they think that i'm like a, a, a like a gross eater like does that no. like, oh. <laughs> or even the first day of school like you think back to the first day of school where everyone's like what what outfit like high school what outfit do i wear and <laughs> no one is thinking about anyone except for themselves yeah, everyone is freaking the fuck out and they're in their mind, like, you know. God. Um, it, my first day of school, it was a mess, but I got best dressed for my superlative, so you know what? <laughs> you did? See? I did. But I was thinking, you know, you put so much thought into just what you're going to look like to people and how you're going to be presented. And it's, um, you know, I think a thing from the South as well, like presentation and like, it is such an old Southern thing to be like on your best and like always, you never can see anyone see a crack or a flaw. You know, therapy's not a talking point down there. Like, you know, and I think that 
living with that, you know, growing up with that, you can't really, you know, if someone went to therapy, they're nuts, you know, if someone, you know, openly talked about their issues, it was immediately looked down on rather than celebrated. And mental health has been that way for a bit. And we're, we are getting to the point where it's a normal conversation. But I think for me personally, growing up where I grew up, always thinking you got to be on your best and never show any, you know, show any like, um, just you can't show that anything's ever wrong. Like it always has to be right. I think that that's why my music has taken a turn where I'm so aggressively honest and aggressively like, <laughs> like shouting from the, you know, from the roof. I, I mean, I remember that first single that I put out with RCA when I, I showed it to you when it was a poem in like 2014 or 13. Okay. And the first line was like, Mama, I sinned again. I went to bed with another man. Oh, was, yeah. Oh. You know, and I was like, you, well, it was a poem at first. And you were like, this is a song. Make it a song. And, you know, so that was my first single ever, like, after the Kygo stuff. And it was so cathartic, like, to just be that honest. And I just felt like, God, you got to just, like, keep doing that. It <laughs> felt scary, but, like, keep doing it, you know. See, this is why I love this, because literally, like, this is, this is, I don't know if Kevin, like you even have like, you know, you, you deal with a lot of, you know, creatives or, you know, in your, in your practice. But I, I do think that like, without even knowing, I'm like, holy crap, like there's such an aspect of psychology to what we do. And I think it really inspired this to be honest, but even things like he just said that when we first met and he read me the poem, like, you know, or the thing of you saying, like, if we were writing a song, Kevin, and you said the walking around four times around the block or things like I would literally be like, so inspired and put that in song. Do you know what I mean? Like to me, that's like my first inclination. Cause I'm like, I know the fact that you said that and we all like, lit up and we're like, Oh my God, we've been through it means that there's a million other people that will relate in the song. So to me, that's so beautiful. I think, uh, I think when you enter that place of being a hundred percent authentic, that that's when your, your truest creative spirit can live and thrive. And, you know, I, I've just started to listen to some of your music, Parson, and you, you now have a new fan here looking at you. Well, thank you. Such an honor to be here, by the way. And, uh, you know, I, I did want to take you to a deep place, Parson, because, you know, you've, you've talked about how even going into some kind of award ceremony, you're still thinking, man, I'm the chub. I'm the chub here. I'm the gay chub here. Oh, my God. It's not just I'm a chub, but I'm the gay chub. Does that make me a double chub or what does that make me? But it's like holding yourself up against this in, uh, invisible uh, a judgment that uh, our society has imposed to tell us what's beautiful and what's not. Uh, and yet here you are writing music that's truly authentic. How did you go from this outside frame of reference, I'm the chub guy, to this inner deep place of it's time to be real? What happened? How did you get there? I think because you know, this, you know, I have felt this way for so long in terms of like how I view my body and myself. It's in my head every single day and has been for a long time. I think that to get to the inner deep place, it just, I don't know, it felt like I called it, like it felt like I, I just felt like maybe I'm just, maybe I'm talking to myself in writing this stuff out and, and being able to formulate a song that goes there um it is my own version of therapy i think um because you know when i do get it out it feels great maybe it feels great only for that day or the moment maybe the next day i don't feel better anymore or whatever but i think that i had to like make such a big change from you know how I was talking to myself every day like I had to, there had to be a big shift like so you know and I think that you know I'm stubborn in the way that I write I'm I am like it has to be like you gotta fucking say it all like you just just do it and I think that that's my own 
inner turmoil struggle with myself, like trying to, I don't know, trying to therapize myself, like trying to get it out so I can feel better. I think that's what has happened, but I've never been asked that question. And that's a great question. And yeah, I mean, saying it out loud for the first time, I think I'm doing a lot of this for myself uh, to, to push through my problems. And again, like I said, in doing that, hopefully helping somebody else. Uh, but it is a big shift. Um, and um, I don't think it's healed me. I don't know, you know, like I think for moments it would, it, it makes me feel good, but I think that there's like a lot of work to do, like on how I treat myself and value myself. Like even writing these songs, you know, writing these songs is one thing, but um, I'm not like fully there with how I should be treating myself. Well, yeah, it's such a hard question to answer, but I think the question that we should ask ourselves is what or when will be the magic moment when we realize that what's inside is truly the core? Yeah, I think about that all the time and I uh, don't know and I wish I did know because I feel get I feel like I get closer and closer to it like a lot of times, but I, I don't know. There's so much need for validation and there's so much like insatiable like want for unconditional love and acceptance. Um, and I just think that that's like a me thing. That's gonna, again, it's gonna be an internal cleanse and like just, be content with me. And I think that that's maybe the magic number or the magic thing. Like it has to come, if it's not here, like it, I just have to keep, I have to quit seeking, I think. Wow. Yeah. This is, this wow. is very, this is powerful, you guys. Really yeah, powerful. I mean, I'm holding back like a lot of tears. I just, yeah, I've just been so unkind to myself and I just am so sick of that, of doing that, you know? I mean, I, I, do, I do know and I feel that um, one thing that this year has really taught me, 2020, um, given like the, you know, everything that we're all going through on a global level, I think that um, manifestations never been so real, honestly. And I think that to the point of like positivity or negativity, um, in my own self, right. Because at the end of the day, I sometimes find that like, it's almost scary how much control we have over what happens and all, over like what you think or how, you know, your day goes or all these things. Like I find like I go outside, take a deep breath and feel this like instant connection to something like the universe and just, I'm like, okay, it's going to be okay. And, and do repeat these things and they, I'm, I'm, I'm good at this. I know I'm, I like, I, you know, the same things like people like me, I have friends. I'm nice. I have a good heart, like things like that instantly. It's like, Oh, like, okay. Yeah. Like, and I feel like it's the same things that I've sort of realized like when you're having a panic attack and you, and you tell yourself like, okay, I'm panicking. I'm, I'm going to be okay. This is why I'm panicking. And it's when you do that, all of a sudden it's like, Oh, and I think if, if we go, as we're going through these things and as we're, you know, learning to love ourselves or, you know, things aren't always going to be perfect. I think to take a second sometimes when you're crashing and just like, even if you have to go to the bathroom, if you're in a weird place, go to the bathroom, like, you know, just take a second and just remind yourself of these things that we talked about today. Yeah, exactly. You have you know? to, you have to, <sighs> that deep breath and you have to do that you know a, a good thing about quarantine is that i've not seen any fucking body so i haven't been so stressed <laughs> <laughs> well i i i i'm I, i'm so i mean it's so sad that we have to oh i know that we have to be done in like a couple minutes here but is there anything else hannah that in the chat or anything else that kevin you want to ask or you know parson that you want to say to the people listening or is any last thoughts that we want to sort of share before we all sadly leave each other today but we will be back because this has been beyond i mean i, I already know i'm gonna hang up and 
and potentially cry, but in a good way, <laughs> starting tears. I actually have a question. Carson, do you find that quarantine, I mean, despite all of the challenges it's given to a lot of people, do you find that you feel more secure being in quarantine and not having to be exposed to the public? Yeah. Or, Keep going. Yeah, like someone asked me yesterday, I think it was, like, how, how are you doing? Are you getting stir crazy? I was like, no, I, I hate everything that's happening to people, but I'm okay being alone in my home with my dog. Yeah, I think this helped me because I have in a week of like an insane, I have had in the past an insane need to constantly be surrounded by people. So I was challenged to, you know, something about like, as simple as sleeping by myself is fucking hard. Like I'm an insomniac and my mind is whatever. So I was challenged to have alone time and I'd never have had that. Like my mom tells me since I was, you know, a child, it was like, you know, we can go on a two week vacation and I'm coming back. Like what are we doing now? Like who are we going to see? Like, does it, you know, I just always needed some stimulation it was hard though, because I mean, I had probably the most severe panic attacks of my life between like April and May, where, you know, I didn't sleep for four days. And like, I was, you know, a, I don't know, I just created these things in my head. Like I thought I had COVID and then I thought like, whatever this, and then I was alone and I was like, there's nobody here to like check on me. Like I was just, you know, there was so much, but it has ultimately ended up being the best thing that could have happened for me. Um, because I learned how to, what Jenna was saying, talk myself out of these panic attacks and these feelings and stuff. Whereas in the past, I would just go out and see people or like go to be with a guy or whatever I was doing um, to block it. Um, I, I just fully dealt with it during this whole quarantine situation. You know, I did start like, I like fell for someone during quarantine. So there was like, you know, of course me, the day before that, we all shut down, like I met a guy and then like we started like this whole whimsical romance thing and that brought me some stress and strain, <laughs> but uh, you know, whatever, self-sabotager. Um, <laughs> Don't say that. Don't say that. We've learned that from today's episode. I'm just kidding. Like that's just what, I, you know, whatever. Um, but aside from that situation, I, yeah, I think it was positive for me. I think it was positive for me to have some alone time. Love that. I love that. Well, thank you guys. I, I, this has been amazing. Kevin, you have, wow. Like some of the stuff you said, was, that was George, George is, is, is apparently saying, saying hello. My dog. <laughs> Even the dog is thanking us. Parson. <laughs> uh, this is part of the zoom life. Right. But thank you guys. I really do appreciate today's um, conversation. It was really meaningful. So. Thank you. I appreciate it so much, everyone. Uh, and I will be posting um, the episode in a couple of days and I'll obviously reach out to both the both of you. So if there's anything else you want to, you know, say to the, when I do my posts or obviously all we have the helplines and stuff like that, but and for anybody listening, I mean, hopefully this helped and I just, I'm sending so much love. So much love. Thank you for, um, thank you for creating the platform and thank you guys for all being so honest and open. Oh, okay, guys. Well, self love today, okay? Care, <laughs> uh, my friends. Bye. Bye. <laughs>